colleagues. On January 9th, 2023, the first day of the 82nd Legislative Assembly, I stood at this amazing rostrum and said to our fellow senators, all our senators, on this floor, there will be bills and policies and budgets, and in the vast majority of times, we will largely agree with our names in green lights. And there will be times when we have fierce debate and disagreement. During the first three months of this session, we accomplished incredible things for Oregonians. We opened the door to collaboration, and I think about the work that each of you did in education and healthcare and housing and revenue and budgets and natural resources and labor and on. And we work together to advance policies and investments that will give our communities the resources and tools they need to thrive. In our communities and in our committees, reflective of our communities, our members' work has continued each and every day. And we have a huge stack of bills sitting right over there on that cart, just waiting for us to take them up, to debate and to vote. And our committees, our Ways and Means committees, will work every day on budgets and continue to work on bills that make Oregon a better place to live and to work. It's been four weeks, nearly a month, People have been working, people have been waiting. And just like in the House, each, each of these bills deserves a vote on the Senate floor. Our voters demand it, the Constitution requires it. The only reason that they are not is that a minority of members are blocking the will of the people in opposition to legislation they personally don't like, starting with the protection of Oregonians' reproductive freedom in the wake of Roe v. Wade. As I told you two weeks ago for the whole session, we have all reached out to work toward bipartisan compromises. Look at our early wins. Housing, semiconductors, jobs, all the bills that moved over to the House from this floor that are now being considered that we hear about every single day. As the walkout over choice began, I included both the Senate leadership and the House leadership negotiating in good faith for days and days to earnestly ask the minority to please return to work asking about process improvements, asking about legislation we could work on together, asking that senators do what the House members just did, to come to this floor and debate legislation to do their constitutional duty. We provided some room this past week. The governor engaged in lengthy negotiations to help broker a deal and also remind the minority of their constitutional obligation. And yesterday, the governor issued a statement detailing all the work and the time spent in a good faith effort to boost the legislative priorities of the minority. That effort was not met in good faith. Colleagues, in today's world, our media likes stories of people. They like stories of conflict, personal conflict, and it's easier there than to report on policy. And as I've often told my constituents, most of what we do down here is pretty boring in terms of process. Thousands of bills introduced, hundreds considered, passed, committees that start meeting at 8 a.m. and sometimes don't stop meeting until 8 p.m. Vast, vast, vast majority of bills that are voted out of committees and across this floor are green lights. They have bipartisan support. 
But sometimes, sometimes in a democracy, we have tough issues to talk about, and that is okay. It's a clashing of worldviews that impact the lives of Oregonians, and that includes reproductive freedom. In other states, it seems every day we read that they're stripping away protection for access to reproductive, reproductive choice. There are rural OBs literally moving from these states, and children and families are choosing to move to other states that don't discriminate against their children. And here in Oregon, we have vitally important legislation that provides these protections to providers, extends reproductive health services, protects people from discrimination. Important legislation that deserves an up or down vote on this Senate floor, just like those bills had in the House, where they had, the choice bill had bipartisan support. This is important legislation that will help vulnerable Oregonians. And we see that the minority wants to kill a bill that has the support of the members of this body representing their constituencies and the majority of Oregonians. And folks, that isn't a democracy. And that is a violation of our Senator's sacred constitutional oath. When I think of this mural behind us that I look up at every day when we walk in here, the Oregon Constitution was framed by a convention of 60 delegates chosen by the people. The convention met on the third Monday in August of 1857 and adjourned on September 18th of the same year. On November 9th, 1857, that Constitution was approved by the vote of the people of the Oregon Territory. The Act of Congress admitting Oregon into the Union was approved February 14th, 1859, year and a half later. And on that date, our state Constitution went into effect, 164 years. And just four years ago, on June 20th, 2019, a former Senate president stood on this rostrum. Many of you are here or are serving in the House when a similar motion to compel the attendance of members was presented and accepted. It was the day after the minority walked out on the legislature for the second time that session, and that Senate president said, quote, when we are chosen to be a state senator, we are given the most glorious, honorable, noble role that a citizen of this country, of this state, could possibly be given. This was the day that a minority of members left this chamber. It was the same time that fines were levied against those members, and the same time we heard of the handwritten letter asking the governor to enlist the support of the state police to compel the attendance of absent members. And let me read something, Article 4, Section 12 of the Oregon Constitution. I think it's important you all have your blue books, you can flip open and read along. Section 12 of our original Constitution talks about the quorum and the failure to affect organization. We hear about the two-thirds of each house that shall constitute a quorum, and then comma, compel the attendance of absent members. But the second sentence is interesting. It says, a quorum being in, in, in attendance, if either house fail to affect an organization within the first five days thereafter, the members of the house so failing shall be entitled to no compensation from the end of said five days until an organization shall be affected. The original Oregon Constitution. We have had people walk off the job from this floor for a month and they've taken compensation. And on June 1st today, today's payday, folks just got paid a month. And the people of Oregon sent 30 senators to represent them in this body and it is our constitutional duty to vote on their behalf right here on this floor. The people of Oregon do not want backroom deals. The people of Oregon don't want kill lists. The people of Oregon want their leaders to lift them up, not to tear each other down. Oregonians work for a living every day, and they don't get paid when they don't show up. My own kids, I have a son who 
delivers sandwiches and works an hourly job assisting an amazing adult with developmental disabilities. I have a daughter who works at a restaurant, and my other son who graduates tomorrow is a swim coach for 10-year-olds and a lifeguard. They don't get paid when they don't show up. Our absentee colleagues have not shown up on the Senate, on this floor, their constitutional requirement. They have not done the business for over four weeks. Would any other worker, I ask you, get away with that? Those of you who have shown up, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know you will continue to show up and do your job. Let's get the Senate back to work for the people of Oregon. As a quorum is not present, and without objection and pursuant to Article 4, Section 12 of the Oregon Constitution and Senate Rule 3.01 sub 2, the Senate is adjourned until 10.30 a.m. Monday, June 5th.